you're going to need your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, we're just carrying on in your series. You've been working through 1 Corinthians for a while here, um, and we're just going to pick it up and carry on. Uh, 1 Corinthians is really a great, great book for the times that we live in, uh, just as if, you know, all scripture is, is great for the times we live in. That's always true. But 1 Corinthians is written to a church that has now all these new believers. This is a brand new thing. They believe in Jesus. They've been rescued from their sins. They realize there is one living God. But now they're realizing that that worldview, that reality that they've come to believe in, clashes with the normal life they've always lived, right? The, the normal behaviors, the going off and, and showing up at a temple and offering a sacrifice and believing that that little statue is a god, suddenly that's, that's thrown out. And they have to realize, I think maybe we have to change the way that we do things a little bit. And so they've written to Paul a number of questions. They've said, Paul, what do, what do we do about this? What do we do about that? And so in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul started a new section. He said, okay, you've asked, uh, concerning food offered to idols, what do you do? Right? This was a, a, an incredibly normal thing for the, for the Corinthians to be uh, taking part in. Uh, it's like most of you here are all planning to go for lunch. You have plans. This is just a normal Sunday thing, right? It's normal. You go off, you have your lunch plans, you go and enjoy it. Uh, it was so normal for them, first of all, to go and take part in worship of idols. Uh, it was also normal to just show up at a market and assume that some of the food had been sacrificed to an idol and it's just kind of a leftover and we'll buy it and we'll take it home and cook it. It's a really, really normal thing, but they're realizing if we believe in Jesus— Maybe something needs to change about the way that we do this. Maybe, maybe we can't do what we've always done. And so uh, the reason 1 Corinthians can be such an applicable book for us today is, is, is it not true if we just back up for a moment and think that the way that we normally live our lives, the way that our culture would convince us that this is the good life, this is just what's normal, is it not true that maybe there are some of those things that our worldview, our view of Jesus being the living God, the Son of God who came and died for our sins, is it not possible that some of those things maybe need to change? Maybe we can't just assume that we're living the right way because there is a God who says there is a best way. And so that's where we find ourselves in, in 1 Corinthians. In chapter 10, uh, where 8, he said, they're talking about food sacrifice to idols. Chapter 10, he zooms out for a second and just wants to talk about idolatry. Idolatry in general. And why, if you're a Christian, if you've trusted in Jesus— it makes absolutely no sense that we would chase after idols. Um, so at the last week, Pastor Norm uh, walked you through the beginning of chapter 10, and, he, and it starts with this illustration of these stories of the Old Testament. You remember? The people of Israel, they go through uh, a baptism of sorts. They go through the Red Sea. They have spiritual food. They eat the manna that's given to them. They, have, they drink the water from the rock that is Christ, he says. They follow this this uh, pillar of smoke and fire at night. They, they had a pretty crazy spiritual experience. If you're sitting around a campfire and you say, hey, tell me the story, you know, of how you came to know God. What's the, how did he bring you to be a part of your people? And there's one of these Israelites sitting there. He's gonna have a pretty crazy testimony, right? Well, I was born, born into slavery. It's all I knew. And then one day Pharaoh said, more bricks, less straw, because this guy Moses showed up and said, let my people go. All of a sudden, boom, 10 plagues, crazy. Locusts, flies, it's dark all of a sudden. Hail, it's the desert. There is hail. Crazy. And then we go out and we get taken out and there's this, this sea that splits. We walk through it. Pharaoh's army behind us, crushed, wild. We go out into the desert, smoke, fire, following it. I grumbled, I'll be honest. And yet God provided food, right? A pretty crazy testimony. You're sitting there thinking, uh, <clears throat> please, anybody but me next, because what am I going to say? I, I was born to a Christian home. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I once stole a pencil in high school and right? A pretty incredible testimony. And yet Paul's point at the beginning of chapter 10 is, listen, they had this incredible story, these experiences of God working in their lives. They could see it. They could taste it. And yet thousands of them fell in the desert because their hearts pined after idols. They loved other gods. And God disciplined them. And the point that he's making is, listen, you and I may have had some pretty incredible spiritual experiences. God may have worked in our lives in incredible ways, but don't fall asleep. Be warned, if they too could fall in love with other idols in the world, so too could you. 
So be warned. And that's where we pick it up in verse 14. So if you have your Bibles, look with me. Verse 14 in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he starts with this command that really defines what he's about to say. And the command is this. Therefore, in light of this whole story, in light of what happened to them, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. Um, that word flee is uh, not, not, you know, a, a light word. It's a pretty significant word. Uh, it, it's a military term. So if you imagine you're in war, you're at battle, and your commander behind you has said, guys, retreat, get out of here. You don't sit there and say, okay, hold well, that's okay, good to know. Let me gather my stuff. I got to figure out what my plans are for lunch, and then we'll get mosey on home. No, if you do that, you're going to die. Because the other army is conquering. Run. Run for your life. That's what he's saying. L listen, d don't just treat, treat this thought of idolatry as, oh, okay, I get it. I shouldn't do this. No, run. <laughs> run for your life. Flee from idolatry. Now, uh, I'm, it feels relatively safe to assume that nobody here has plans uh, to go off to a, a Hindu temple after this and bow down to a carved image um, or potentially go to a, a cult, you know, a worship service and sacrifice an animal and eat some meat. I think that's probably safe to assume. If that is you, uh, can I just say that uh, this text is going to be particularly relevant? Um, but I, I would venture to guess that that's not true for many of us. So s some of us sometimes hear the commands against idolatry and think, great. That's another one I can check. I, I'm pretty good on that one. I don't, I don't bow down to any kind of carved idols. I know a rock is a rock and a tree is a tree. I'm pretty good here. But idolatry uh, is so much more than simply a, a, a little set up idol of rock and wood. Um, one, one of the best verses in the Bible, I think, that describes what idolatry is, is found in Romans chapter 1. And it, it says this. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshipped created things rather than the creator. So I idolatry at its very heart is thinking less of God than he truly is, and thinking more of his creation than it is. Less of God than he truly is, and more of his creation than it is. So let me give you a, let me give you a little a Bible story. I think really illustrates this well for how idolatry can happen in, in your life and mine. Um, you probably know this story in, in the book of Matthew. A young man comes up to Jesus and he says, "Hey Jesus, what, what do I have to do to be saved? What is it? What will it take?" And Jesus says to him, "Well, have you have you obeyed the law? Right? Have you? Thou shalt not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not uh, bear false witness. You love your neighbor as yourself." And the guy looks at Jesus and he says, "Did it? I done it." which is pretty bold, right? To be honest, if Jesus was here and he said, have you obeyed the law? You say, yeah, I did it. Um, that's bold. And Jesus looks at him and he says, okay, well, one thing you lack, go sell all your possessions and follow me. And we're told that he went away deeply sad because he was very wealthy. So, so here, here's, the, here's the point. He loved the money that he had, the creation of money, this thing that God himself had made, he loved that more than he loved the living God standing right in front of him. Right in front of him. And so the question of idolatry that I can put to you is this. Is there anything in your life that if Jesus were standing here and he said to you, hey, listen, one thing you lack, if you would go and get rid of this, whatever it might be, money, fame, status, your job, your reputation. Go and get rid of that. Leave that behind and come follow me. Is there anything that might make that list that would make you hesitate? That you would find difficult to let go? That's idolatry. To worship and adore something more than the living God and the point of what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 10 is none of us are immune to that. We can all fall into that temptation. And so, so he says, flee this idolatry. Flee the love of the world and come after the living God. And so here's what he's going to do. He's going to point out for us two reasons why it makes no sense whatsoever for you and I to chase after idols in our lives. Two reasons that it makes no sense. He says, flee from idolatry. And the two reasons are this. If you continue chasing idols, you're doing two things. You are denying your salvation. 
and you're dabbling with demons. It's pretty, pretty sobering statements, but that's what he, that's what he gets. So this is no, no joke. You're denying your salvation and you're dabbling with demons if we continue to chase idols in our lives. So let's, let's begin with the first of those. You're, you're denying your salvation. Uh, verse 15, if you pick that up with me. He says this, I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. I love that. Um, only an apostle can look at you in the eye and say, listen, uh, you're smart, so you can figure this out. Um, I, can't, I couldn't do that if I'm in conversation, particularly with my wife. That would be problematic. Uh, but he can say this because he knows they know it. Listen, I speak to smart people. You can get this. I speak as to sensible people. Verse 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Okay, what's he saying? So, uh, probably catch that he's talking about communion, right? The, the cup we bless and the bread that we break, that we participate in, when we, when we take it, he's saying that we are participating with the blood of Christ. We're participating with the, the body of Christ. Now, that word participation is really the key of what, what Paul's saying. In, uh, the Greek word there is the word koinonia, which means fellowship. When, when you take communion, as we're going to do, I see today, when you take communion, what you're, what you're doing is you are embracing, you're saying that I have fellowship with the blood of Christ. I have fellowship with the body of Christ, which is his physical body truly on the cross for you, but also the, the body of Christ, right? The church. I have fellowship I participate with. Now that, that fellowship is, is the key point of what Paul's saying. Right? It doesn't make sense for you to chase idols if you take communion and see that your salvation— is fellowship with the living God. And this fellowship is more than, you know, let's sit down and have a coffee, Jesus. Uh, this fellowship is something so rich, so deep, so intimate that the New Testament will time and time and time again describe you and me, if we put our faith in Jesus, as being found in Christ. Do you know that language? You've, you've heard it. We are, we are in Christ and he is in me. So, so communion that Paul is picking up as an illustration, communion means this. It's a symbol of what has happened to you by faith. You have been brought into such close fellowship with Jesus, with his body, with his blood, that what was accomplished by him on the cross is counted as your own accomplishment. That, that's, that's what we're saying when we take communion. We're saying Jesus truly died truly was buried, he truly rose from the grave. And when I take communion, I am saying that I have been counted with him. His death was my death. So you, you'll, you'll know this first, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Ephesians chapter two goes even further. Not only did you die with Christ, your, your union with him, your fellowship with him is so, so much that God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. You, you were dead and you came to life with Christ. By grace, you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What happened to Christ if you've been saved, if you come to communion to make the statement of faith that I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been united to him in such a way that when he died, you died. When he rose, you rose. When he ascended to the right hand of his father, in some true sense, you ascended to the right hand of the father. You are with him right now. Your life is hidden in Christ, the hope of glory, right? Um, Martin Luther, the great reformer, uh, he had a pretty troubled experience of being a follower of God, right? He was a monk for many years, and he saw the righteousness of God, this great theme, as something to be afraid of, something so fearful. It was the standard to which God expected that we live. And so he actually got to the point, uh, he, he would say that he, he hated the righteous God. 
Because he thought, how could I ever live up to the expectations of a God who knows I can't live up to his expectations? He would spend six hours in confession as a monk. And because he was in there for six hours, he would miss a, a chapel service. And so he would stay in confession longer to confess that he'd missed his chapel service. He was, he was just a man plagued by this sense that I cannot live up to what God has called me to. And then one day he has this great moment where he's reading Romans and he realizes that the way that Paul describes the righteousness of God is not as a standard to which you and I need to live, but as something which God actually shares with us by faith. And so he, he, as he's come to this realization, he comes up with a bit of an illustration. He thinks, how can I share the gospel with people? And he goes to the book that every single one of you, if you're sharing the gospel, you would go to this book, I'm sure. Song of Songs, chapter two, <laughs> verse 16, which says this. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And he picks that up and he says, Here, here's, here's the gospel. Here's what happened to us when we put our faith in Jesus. Imagine a king, a great king who rules all things. He's good, he's kind, he's righteous. Imagine this king and imagine a woman who's a deeply sinful, wayward woman. What could possibly make this woman the wife of the king? What could possibly make her the queen? Does she just need to go put on a new set of clothes and show up to a couple prayer meetings and maybe attend a couple church services? Would that make her the queen? No, that, it wouldn't. It'd be, those would be good things, but they wouldn't make her the queen. What's the only thing that could possibly take this woman and make her the bride of the king? It would be if the king came to her and said, I take you as my own. And she says, yes, please. So he says in this, in this wedding ceremony that they have together, they make their vows and their vows go like this. She looks at him and says, all that I have, I give to you. And all that I am, I share with you. My shame, my guilt, my sin, my debt, my fears, I share them with you. And the king looks at her and says, all that I have, I give to you. And all that I am, I share with you. My righteousness, my wisdom, my father is your father. My kingdom, my glory, all that I have, I give to you. That was the gospel that Martin Luther discovered and it changed his entire life and quite frankly changed the, the trajectory of the church for many, many centuries. Is that the gospel that you, you think of? That Jesus has said to you, I will take you as my own, all your burdens, all your shame, all your guilt, all of it. You are mine. You have fellowship with me. I take them, I bear them, I'll deal with them. And in return, you get all that I have. All that is mine is yours by sheer kindness and grace. Fellowship with the living God. But the greatest of all the blessings that we receive in this union with Christ, in this fellowship that we enjoy, the greatest of all blessings is Christ himself. It's God himself. Um, you'll know these two verses. Well, it's, well you'll, know, you'll know the first of these two verses. I'll doubt that you know the second, actually. Um, and if you get nothing else out of this morning because you're already asleep, um, take away these two verses. John three sixteen. you know it. You could quote it to me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. There's the good news of Jesus. If you believe in the Son, you'll, you won't perish. You'll have eternal life. What is eternal life? We, we tend to run past those two words because we just assume we know what they mean, right? Eternal life must be life for a very long time. Is that what it means? Okay, if you're taking notes, write this down. John 17, 3. Jesus, again, is speaking, but he's praying to his Father. Same book, same speaker, Jesus himself. He prays to the Father, and he says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the living God, and Christ whom you sent. This is eternal life, to know the living God, to know Christ his son. So in a very real sense, the good news of the gospel is this. You can enjoy a living relationship with the living God. That's the good news. <laughs> The means to the end is the death of Christ on the cross. That's how he brings us near. But the joy of our salvation, the, the fruit of our salvation is that we get to know him. When we pray, we pray to a father. When we hear the word, we hear our father speak to us. 
a living relationship with the living God. So do you see, now back to what Paul is arguing here, do you see why he would say that communion points us to the foolishness of idolatry? If, if you're saying in communion that I have fellowship with this living God, that what I've received in salvation is that I know him, I enjoy him as my father, it makes no sense to chase after idols. Because what we've gained in this Christ, what he shows us in communion, is that Christ himself not only gives his life for you, he gives his life to you. You have him, Christ is yours, and you are his. Meaning you have the faithful commitment of the living, almighty, all good God. He has said, I'm yours and I will care for you as my own. My children, Christ says my bride, you're mine. This living God who promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13 verse 5. He says he feeds the sparrows, he clothes the lilies. Will he not care for you? Matthew 6. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds, says Christ. Philippians 4.19, Paul says, He, Jesus, will supply every need of yours according to the riches of his glory. Is it not true that the reason that we chase after idols, whatever it is, might be for you, that you're, you're chasing money because you think that it can provide for you something? security, safety, a, a future. You're chasing a relationship because you feel like that's all, there's a void in your life. If you don't have it, you need something there. So when you chase your idols, you're thinking, this offers me something that I need and I'm not getting. What you're saying is that God really isn't who he says he is. He really actually won't do what he says he'll do. He says he'll provide for my every need. I'm not seeing it, so I'm not believing it. So let me just find my own way in this world. Yeah, yeah, I still believe in Jesus. I come to church. But I believe I have to chase after this other thing in order to get the life I think I should have. Could it not be, uh, if we just take that for a moment and think, think it through, you think you need something and so you chase after it. Could it not be that either, A, if you really need it, your good father who has said all your burdens are mine, could it not be that he will provide for you in some way that you just don't expect? Maybe even a way you don't want, but it's the best way because he's the good father in heaven. Or could it not be that maybe you just don't actually really need it, right? Lord, I desperately need a Porsche. I'm just desperate. I can't imagine my life without it. Maybe, maybe you don't need the Porsche. Could it not be? Now, uh, if I'm honest, if maybe if, if we're honest, I don't think we tend to think of our salvation in the way that I've just described it a living relationship with the living God. Which I think is a, is a real shame because that is the gospel, that is the good news that we receive through Christ. Um, and if I can just point out for a second, because I think this is worth hovering on, uh, point out two reasons that I think this is the case, why you and I don't tend to think of our relationship with God or our salvation as that living relationship with him. Uh, and the two reasons are this. I think, first of all, uh, we tend to think of salvation as almost exclusively being saved from something, and not to something. We're saved from our debt, our sins, right? We, we have this problem. We should, Romans, Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. We should pay the penalty. Good news of Jesus, he takes that away. I don't have to pay it. Woo, saved from my sin, right? And so we have this eternal get out of trouble card. We can kind of, kind of, and maybe some of us do this, justify going off and chasing idols because we think, well, yeah, I'm going to, I, I want it. I'm going to go after it. But at the end of the day, I'm going to come back to church and I'll, I'll read that prayer of confession. I'll say, I'm sorry. And God will forgive me because he's a good God. He's gracious. He's kind. I'll get out of trouble. Again. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a new father. Uh, just seven weeks ago, had our first little boy. And suddenly I'm realizing that there were a lot of things that I did as a little boy that I really don't want my son to do. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we would do would sit, was to sit around the dinner table and they had a bit of a rule. My parents, you don't leave the table till the food is gone. Okay, you're not going anywhere. Now we would try all sorts of strategies, right? There was a lot of food in the air vent. There was food under the table. 
Sometimes it worked, often it didn't. But we would sit there, and sometimes we would sit there and sit there and sit there, and we knew that if we waited long enough, my dad would go downstairs, and my mom would be there washing the dishes, and we would say, Mom, do we have to stay? And she'd say, no, it's okay. Chuck it, chuck it in the garbage, and off we go. I think sometimes we, we treat our living God that way. I can, I can do what I want. I can kind of pursue some idols in this world. I can chase money for a while. I can chase fame. I can, I can let my heart turn towards something. Because if I just wait long enough, if I pray hard enough, if I just come to church enough times, then eventually God will say, it's all right. No biggie. Carry on. Um, can I just say that this way of thinking totally empties the Christian life of its fullness, its joy, its glory. We're not just saved from consequences. We're saved to that living relationship with the living God. He's with us, near to us, calls us his children, and we call him our father. Not just saved from consequences, saved to God himself. The second reason that I think we, we do this uh, is that somehow, for some reason, and this is, I mean, for some reason, sin, uh, we're not convinced that knowing the living God as my Father, who promises himself to me for eternity, uh, is actually all that satisfying. I'm just not convinced that that would be good enough for me to have a happy, happy life. Um, all right, you've got, we've got relational needs. We've got physical needs. We've got emotional needs. And sometimes we're believing in God and we think, I'm just not getting any of those things. I'm not getting the needs that I think I have. So obviously God's not cutting his end of the deal. So eventually I've just got to kind of go my own way and chase my own things. Um, can I just tell you that the whole testimony of the Bible is the exact opposite of that? That truly God does provide everything you need, Right? Paul went so far in Philippians 3, verse 8, to say this, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. He truly is worth giving our lives to. Not just because he's worthy, because he's God, because he's good and kind and cares for his children, provides every need they have, maybe not in the way you wish and want and desperately plead that he would, but he certainly cares, certainly loves. So back to the, back to the point here in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul's, Paul's telling the church, flee from idolatry. And reason number one is that it just makes no sense. If we knew that we had in Christ what, what is pictured to us in communion, a living relationship with the living God, fellowship with a father who created all things. If we knew what we had, how could we possibly chase idols? We have everything, everything we could possibly need. Makes no sense. If we keep on chasing idols, we're denying our salvation. Secondly, if we chase idols, if, if you chase idols with your life, you're dabbling with demons. Now, this is where things get a little strange, according to Paul, but uh, I think there's a reason that he gets, he gets here. So let's, let's read text, uh, verse 19. We'll pick it up there. Sorry, verse 18. Um, Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar. So he takes a moment to just illustrate, hey, if you're not quite getting this with the whole communion thing, just think back to the people of Israel. When they did a sacrifice and they ate of the sacrifice, were they not saying, we're a part of the people of God? The Lord is our God. We are his people. Are they not having fellowship with him through this? Yes. The, the short answer is yes. He illustrates it. Verse 19. What do I imply though? That uh, food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? You remember this back in, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 8. He's saying, listen, and we know that an idol is nothing. There's no other God than the living God. So yes, you can chase idols and there's no deity behind it, right? Truly. And yet, yet, I do not want you, or sorry, no, I, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants 
with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So, so that, well, you hear the word again, participant. So just as we have fellowship with the living God, as the Old Testament saints would have fellowship with him through the altar, through the sacrifices, idols, though there is no God behind them, there truly is demonic work drawing us to them. And do you not understand, says Paul, that if you go and live after idols, you are participating, having fellowship with demons. Wow, what a sobering reality. That's not what we think is the case, is it? Is it truly? When I, if I am going to give my life over to the love of money, there's, a, there's demonic power behind that? Yes, says Paul. If I chase after success and, and job uh, improvement, if I chase after that next salary, if I chase after that fame and that status, there's, a, there's demonic power behind that? Yes, says Paul. And he's saying it makes no sense that you who say you have fellowship with the living God would go and have fellowship with the demonic. How does, in, what, in what world does that make sense, says Paul? And the conclusion of his point here is he, he, he comes to verse 22 and he says, shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now, a jealousy, we got to kind of make sense of uh, for a moment. You and I tend to read onto God things that we experience in our own lives. Um, our jealousy is very different than his jealousy, right? If my wife went off to be with another man, my sinful tendency in jealousy would be to be jealous for my sake. How could she do that to me, right? I'm the one who's being wronged and scorned and all these things. When God is jealous, it's not that way. He's jealous for you, knowing that it is to your harm that you would chase idols, knowing that it is to your detriment that you wouldn't know the fellowship that he has for you, everything that he gives to you. It's to your detriment. Uh, God has always sought after and desired your highest good. Jesus said that he came to bring life and life to the full. The best, richest life you could imagine, he has it. He can offer it. And he's actually designed life to be at its fullest, richest, best when it's spent with him. So apart from the hypocrisy and the faithfulness, faithlessness of going and, and having fellowship with the demonic— Apart from the fact that that just is absolutely incoherent, what's the danger? What's the danger here? Well, uh, I mean, there's, there's probably two real important ones. First is that there is a very real physical danger, spiritual power that can do things in our lives, right? You think of the story of Job. Satan stands before God and says, let me, let me go at him. <laughs> Let's see if he still worships you after this. And God lets him to an extent, right? Which, which is great encouragement, right? The devil can only go so far as the Lord lets him. But he goes and Job's family dies. His crops are destroyed. His livestock are stolen. <clears throat> the devil and his minions can do real things in our lives. They have power. Only the power the Lord lets them have, but they have power. There's a true physical power danger. But I think, I think in some sense, maybe more importantly, there's a principle in the scriptures that I think is important to understand when we're talking about fellowship with, with such things. And it's this, there, there's a reality that, that those we spend time with, we become like. Right, there's going to be a few examples. First one uh, you can think of in 1 Corinthians 15. He's later going to say this as you get here, but he says, don't be deceived. Good, bad company ruins good morals. I was a youth pastor for a very brief stint before I realized I was just not cool enough. Um, and it was one of the most common things to see that the good kid, the kid who just had this real sense of, I love the Lord and my parents have taught me well, they would show up and suddenly they get caught up in the cool crowd and they're saying things they shouldn't say. They're mocking people unkindly. All of a sudden, they are not the same kid when they're at youth group than when I've hung out with them for coffee. That's just a principle that the Bible says is, is reality. You become like those you, you fellowship with. Now, 
Um, another example, which is, I mean, the best example, is this is the reality of us in God. 2 Corinthians 3.18, um, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of God are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. Okay, just for a a brief pause, because this verse is so important. If you are in your Christian life right now sitting and wondering, I feel like I'm I'm not growing. I feel stagnant, cold, like I'm not moving anywhere. Pin this verse to your heart, because he says that the way that we are transformed is by beholding the glory of God. Where do you behold the glory of God? Well, certainly in his word, certainly in among his people, certainly in his creation, and chiefly at the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus actually said, the hour of my glorification is when I'll be lifted up. Spend time with the living God. In fact, uh, a great example of this is Moses in Exodus 34. He comes down from the mountain, right? He's been given the law, and he comes down, and it says that his face was shining, radiant, and the people said, no, Moses, put put a veil. We just can't look at you and have a conversation. Why'd that happen? Because he spent time with the living God and it changed him. He became more like the one he was with. If you want to grow in your Christian life, you've got to spend time with the living God. Um, and then here to what we're talking about. We become more like the idols and the demons that we spend time with. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 15. I think this is just a piercing verse in the Old Testament. Talking about the people of Judah, he says, they despised his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and the warnings he gave them. They went after false idols and became false. And they followed the nations that were around them concerning whom the Lord had commanded them that they should not do like them. Two really important words in the Old Testament, Hebrew words, the word kavod, which is the glory of God, the weightiness, the substance, the fullness of God all that he is, kabod, and the word hevel, which is the word for emptiness, vanity. Think of the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities. Everything is vanity. It's, it's meaningless. It's empty. Well, that word hevel is the word for false in this passage. They went after empty idols and became empty. Um, Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis is a brilliant little book. If you've never read it, it's a great summer reading kind of book, really easy to, to get through, and yet there's some profound comments that he makes in it. And when he's talking, this is, it's a book of a, a, a senior demon writing to a junior demon, trying to figure out, hey, how do, we, how do we get our teeth into our subject, our patient? And at one point, the, the, the senior demon, Screw Tape, is writing to this, this fellow worker, and he says to them, God, he, he really does want to fill the universe with a lot of loathsome little replicas of himself. Creatures whose life on a miniature scale will be qualitative like his own, not because he has absorbed them, but because their wills freely conform to his. Hear this. We want cattle who can finally become food. He wants servants who can finally become sons. We want to suck in. He wants to give out. We are empty and would be filled. He is full and flows over. 2 Kings 17, they chased after empty idols and became empty. Is that not a brilliant description of our sinful nature? Empty and longing to be filled and looking at everything around the world and saying, that might fill me. And we chase it and chase it and chase it only to realize that money itself is empty. (laughs) We chase our jobs and we chase it and chase it only to realize that it will only require more of us in order for us to get more of it that desperately wants more of us. We have to give our our entire selves over to it and become just as it is empty. Vanity. Meaningless. And yet to come and know the living God who is kavod, glorious, full. When we fellowship with him, we become like him full, full of life, full of joy so that we might go and actually respond to what Jesus says and says, deny yourselves, pick up your cross and follow me. If anyone finds his life, he'll lose it. If anyone loses his life for my sake, he finds it. 
fullness of life is here with me. Don't go chasing idols because you'll become like them. The demonic power behind them will draw you to be like them, grasping, needy, selfish, always looking for more. Come to the living God who gives all that he has to you. All that is mine, I give to you. All that I have, I share with you, he said. If we chase idols and demons, we'll inevitably become like them. The Lord is jealous after his people, rebuking and disciplining us that we might see the futility of chasing after anything other than him because it will empty us and leave us longing for more and more and desperately chasing it again. So as I, as I uh, bring this to a close, can I just ask you a question? What are you chasing right now? What has captivated your heart that it occupies your thoughts and you think, if only I had this, if only I had money, fame, health, power, status, security, if only I had these things, I will finally be full, satisfied, and happy. Listen, what Paul is saying, flee from it. Run for your life because it will only do you harm to chase the emptiness of idols. It will only do you harm. And not only that, you're denying what you already have. You have the living God. He says, you're mine, I'm yours. I'll provide everything you need and I will take you when the day comes to be with me in the home that I have prepared for you where there are no tears, there's no pain, no suffering and eternally you will enjoy fellowship with me. That day will come. We've gained everything we need. So let's not be deceived when our hearts bend toward the things of the world. We not only deny our glorious salvation, we actually dabble with the powers that seek only to empty us because they themselves are empty. We have a great God in heaven who loves us far too much to see us chase the empty offers of the world. Turn to him. Enjoy your salvation a living relationship with the living God who says, you're mine, I'm yours. Live the great adventure of having a heavenly father. Let me pray. God, we are so thankful that when we come to your word, we hear you speak. And I ask that that would be the case this morning, that for each of us in some way, Father, we would hear your voice, whether it be a reminder that we have so much in our salvation to be enjoyed, God, would you, would you press that to our hearts? Help us to truly enjoy our salvation. If it would be a rebuke, Father, an exhortation, a, a, a call to reject idols in our lives, Lord, would you make that known to us? Would you reveal to our hearts the things that have captivated our attention that draw us away from you and inevitably leave us empty? Father, would you reveal those things to us and help us to flee with all our might to run for our lives back to you where we receive everything we need. So God, we glory in our salvation and we pray even as we sing, as we take communion, God, would you restore unto us the joy of our salvation that we might sing and receive communion with full hearts. God, we love you and we're thankful for all you've done for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen.